Hi, my name is Matthew Pluster, and I'm the Assistant Dean of the Graduate School. And my name is Logan Gowers. I'm the Tuition Benefit Administrator for the Graduate School. And we're your Tuition Benefit team here to help you with the Tuition Benefit Guidelines for Academic Year 2024-2025. What we'll cover today in this training is updates to the tuition benefit program guidelines, including tuition benefit structure, tuition benefit support types, switching to the waiver system, and updated rules, as well as academic year credit hour limit adjustments. We'll also be reviewing the updated entry process and previewing planned update reports. The tuition benefit program includes two different types of tuition benefit. First, we have waived tuition benefits. This is tuition being written off by the university, which represents a reduced tuition revenue, a loss of tuition revenue. This includes resident tuition and mandatory fees and the non-resident waiver where applicable. The other type of tuition benefit is sponsored tuition benefits where there is a reduction of tuition by way of billing resident tuition and mandatory fees to a sponsoring funding source, which includes research grants, faculty startup packages, donor funds, department discretionary funds, and for research assistance working on payroll, where there is not a different funding source, the return to FNA to your college. The university will, in these cases, continue to waive the non-resident waiver where applicable. This is a brief illustration of that structure, the tuition benefit program overall with waived tuition benefits and sponsored tuition benefits where we have RAs built to f a which is similar to the current structure right now, and resident tuition charged to a chart field that you will provide at the time of entry, which is currently called extended tuition benefit, which will now be called sponsored tuition benefits. We will be revising support types. To help streamline the program, we will be combining all research assistants under the Research Assistant Designation, or RA. The current GR job code will be retired. So all research assistants, whether their payroll comes on a research project or an activity, will be on the RA job code. This also means that you can have split distributions of payroll between a research grant and an activity. Teaching assistants will all be consolidated under the TA job code. The GT job code will be retired. GT was associated with the International Teaching Assistantship Program, but that will now be managed outside of the GT job code. Graduate fellows, where grad fellows are paid every semester through the scholarship administration system, will continue to be designated as a GF. New this year will be traineeships or TR. This is where your students are research assistants or participants in a training program paid on a training grant. This is where their support is not allowable as a payroll source and they are paid on a monthly recurring payment through the Office of Income Accounting. Also new this year, the university has created a new job code, 1632, for graduate assistantships not associated with tuition benefit. The RA and TA job codes are exclusive to the tuition benefit program. And should you have a student uh, fulfilling research or teaching assistantship duties, but not participating in tuition benefit, you can now use the 1632 job code. We will be switching from a dollars and cents allocation system to a waiver system. Dollars and cents allocations have proven to be difficult for programs and colleges to balance in relation to student need. They can be restrictive to student enrollments, as well as a simple understanding of the strategic enrollment management in each program. Generally, when you graduate one student, you can enroll one student and your resource needs will remain the same. However, with a dollars and cents allocation system mixed with a reduced tuition rate for PhD students and dissertation hours, for example, you need to graduate 2.5 PhD students in dissertation hours to be able to admit one student into coursework for your resources to remain steady. So moving to a waiver system of one student equals one waiver, 
will simplify this process quite a bit. Waivers will cover up to 12 graduate credits and as little as three credits of thesis or dissertation. Waive Tuition Benefits, or WTB, covers TAs, RAs with payroll on activities, GFs, and TRs. Additionally, we are eliminating fractional benefits, a 50% or 75% tuition benefit. Starting this coming year, academic year 25, students will be 100% tuition benefit in order to participate in the tuition benefit program. Projections are based on the number of students served for academic year 24. So if you served or supported by a tuition benefit, let's say 100 students last year, we are providing you a projection of 100 waivers for the coming year. Uh, similar to the dollars and cents allocation, waivers are a college resource that are distributed between the academic programs and departments at the discretion of your college's dean. So this means that if you have a need for additional waivers, that is a conversation you need to raise with your dean's office. Final budget waiver counts are under review at this time. We anticipate that these will be sent out to each college and department by June 20th. Um, and your college will make the determination of the distribution and report that back to the graduate school, which will then be entered into the tuition benefit program. Uh, which you will see when we go over the entry process. We will also be removing restrictive rules. From now on, we will be following the Office of the Registrar definition of full-time enrollment. This means that if your student is in thesis or dissertation, which is catalog range 6970 to 6989 and 7970 to 7989, three credits will be considered full-time. This means that they will only need to enroll in three dissertation credits to be eligible for tuition benefit. For those who are eligible and participating in the subsidized health insurance program, three credits of dissertation will be considered full-time and qualify them to participate in the health insurance plan. We are eliminating the 84 credit hour rule for RAs. We are eliminating the first year or first degree restriction which uh, currently means that if a student has a master's degree already, they do not qualify to be supported on tuition benefit in a master's degree program. Similar with doctoral programs, for example, if a student has a clinical doctorate like an MD or a DPT and they are pursuing a PhD program, currently they are not eligible to be supported because they have a doctorate already and are pursuing another doctorate. That restriction will be eliminated starting fall 2024. We are also eliminating semester limits. This is where a master's student is limited to four semesters of tuition benefit support and doctoral students, depending on where they earn their master's or if they even have a master's degree, are limited to between eight and 10 semesters of tuition benefit support. Uh, all of these rules are being changed here at the graduate school level. However, it is at the discretion of your academic dean whether or not there will be rules in your college for participation in tuition benefit. Your dean's office may be implementing semester limits similar to what the tuition benefit program has utilized, or they might not. Please check in with your dean's office for any restrictions that they may be placing on the tuition benefit program. And lastly, we are increasing from 24 credit, graduate credit hours a year to 30 credits a year. Um, 12 credits will continue to remain the maximum for fall and spring that tuition benefit will cover, but this will allow your students to maximize their tuition benefit opportunity in fall, spring, and the summer semester. Tuition benefit will cover up to 12 in the fall, 12 credits in the spring, and six credits during the summer semester, provided that they meet the minimum financial support requirements. This change will allow students to maximize their enrollment and depending on their degree program and their enrollment, potentially graduate sooner on a more efficient timeline. Please note that the Office of the Registrar does have a policy that indicates that if students are on campus and utilizing university facilities during the summer, they should be enrolled in courses. Uh, this also extends to university resources, including equipment, 
faculty time, PI time, and advisement when working on student projects and student milestones. If this describes your student, they should be enrolled during the summer semester. We're also very excited to introduce some new information regarding the new entry portal. Now, while we are excited to share this information with you, we would note that everything in the following slides is still under development. What we are showing today includes the desired end goal for new entry processes and reports. However, it is very likely that some of the following elements may be subject to change. We appreciate your flexibility at this time and hope that you understand some small growing pains may be expected as we move forward in this process. Any major changes that we expect, we will make sure are communicated out to all coordinators as soon as possible. Please look forward to the following. We are updating the new entry portal to have some updates to the landing page. Some of those updates include updating the allocation information to instead show the waiver information that reflects our new changes in the guidelines. You'll get information such as your total waivers for the term, your entered waivers for the term, and how many you have remaining. We also will have some minimum support requirements uh, there for your review. Additionally, we will be updating the information that shows support types to better reflect our changes to the guidelines. Additionally, I wanted to make sure that we included a notation that shows whether students are on waived tuition benefit or sponsored tuition benefit. So as a review, allocation information will be changed to waiver information, waiver information will be shown by term, remaining waivers will be shown clearly for ease of use, and entry information will be updated to include the new support types and whether a student is marked as waived or sponsored tuition benefit. Other features such as the ability to update, delete, add students, or review the signature page will be staying as they are. Now, as you go into the entry portion where you are actually entering your students, you'll notice some significant changes. For example, you'll notice that in focusing here, the XTVP option that was here before will now say sponsor the student's resident tuition and mandatory fees via chart fields or FNA returned overhead. Uh, this is for both clarity and to better match our new guidelines and our new wording for sponsored tuition benefit. Additionally, as you are doing that entry, you'll notice that the support types have been updated to match our new guidelines as well. As you are doing entries for sponsored tuition benefit, you will still see chart fields appear in the appropriate places. You can still do multiple chart fields as needed. Additionally, however, we have marked, uh, included an option to mark RA students to be charged to FNA return to overhead instead of a chart field. This is for RAs with payrolls on grants only, and it will only show in the RA options. We just want to make sure that's available for you so you can keep track of that and use your sponsored tuition benefit appropriately. So as a review, minimum support requirements will be removed as with all students are now supported at the 100% tuition benefit level. You may have noticed that the plan amount is no longer on this page, that is why. Support types have been updated to reflect our changes. Extended tuition benefit entry has been updated to reflect the new wording for sponsored tuition benefit. Both GSHIP and sponsored tuition benefit options have added wording for clarity. And the option to designate RA students with payroll and grants to have their resident tuition and mandatory fees charged FNA return overhead instead of using a waiver will be available as well. Now, as far as the entry process timeline, there are very few changes that are occurring here. Portal entry will still remain at six weeks prior to the first day of courses. Portal closure will remain onto the day of census, leaving you about nine weeks or so of entry time. GSHIP enrollment will still occur as rapidly as possible after tuition benefit entry occurs, but students still need to meet all requirements for GSHIP enrollment for me to complete that process for them. That includes minimum enrollment requirements, signing their tuition benefit agreement, and being entered for tuition benefit in the portal. The email students receive prompting them to sign their tuition benefit will be automatically sent overnight up to 24 hours after entry. Uh, this is different from the current process where it sends instantaneously. This change is put in place to allow time for coordinators to make edits and deletions prior to that email being sent to students, preventing students from receiving confusing or incorrect information. 
Students can still manually sign their TB agreement without the email via their student homepage should you have any need to expedite that process. Tuition benefit will still disperse approximately one week prior to the first day of courses. Now, before we go over reports, I want to remind you that everything in the following slides is still under development. What we are showing today includes our desired end goal for the processes that we are showing today. However, some elements of the following are likely subject to change or will be delivered in multiple stages over the next year. This is most important with the reports as this is most likely going to be a staged rollout of these elements. The first thing we wanna make sure is that updated on the reports is that the waiver information is reflected appropriately per our new guidelines. So you will see a breakdown of both waived tuition benefit and sponsored tuition benefit. You'll notice that waivers used for each semester will be available for you to review, how many students you have on chart field or being charged to F&A return to overhead. We wanted to include a lot of useful information for you to review as needed for your department decision-making purposes. That includes some information on the amount of tuition that is being waived for tuition benefit, including both waived and sponsored tuition benefit, so that you can review these numbers and make important decisions within your areas as needed. Additionally, when looking at students, we wanted to add more information that might be helpful for you. For example, we wanted to expand enrollment and to, to show not just the total enrollment, but also the total lecture enrollment, thesis enrollment, and any credits that would not be covered by tuition benefit. We also wanted to include some information on GPA, total tuition, including resident tuition and fees, and non-resident tuition. Semesters of usage will still be available for review, including total term counts, and hopefully breaking down both waived tuition benefit and sponsored tuition benefit individually. We hope this information will be helpful for you, and if there's anything that you think might be useful to include in the reports, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at this time. Much of this is under development, and we are very excited to get your feedback. Please note, this is the following are requested updates for the reports. More clear information regarding tuition coverage, especially for sponsored tuition benefit, which will be charged to a provided chart fields or f and return overhead. More clear enrollment data for students, including breaking down uncovered or undergraduate credits. Semesters of tuition benefit usage outlined for department review. And annual information updated as the year progresses for better use in department decision making and future planning. A quick note on GSHIP. We are under a new contract for academic year 25 with United Healthcare Student Resources. They will continue to remain as our medical insurer at this time. The plan is currently sitting with the Utah Insurance Department, and we have our typical materials coming to us soon, and we'll share those with you in due course as they are provided to us. We expect the premium costs will increase by about 1.3%. You could budget for 1.5 or 2% if you wanted to be careful. New plan feature that will be included this year is tiered prescription benefit. There will be no more need for submitting reimbursements manually for prescriptions. Students will have a prescription plan. Some quick frequently asked questions that we've had recently about the new tuition benefit program. Summer enrollment and tuition benefit. Is summer enrollment now required? No, summer enrollment is not required in general sense. Uh, we are increasing credits from 24 to 30 credits a year to make an effort to provide summer tuition benefit support where possible for students and departments. So as undergraduate enrollment continues to rise and graduate enrollment continues to rise as well, there may be more opportunities for research assistants and teaching assistants to work during the summer allowing them to participate in the tuition benefit program. Especially for students in master's programs, this may provide them a quicker or a more efficient timeline to completion. Do students who are working during the summer need to be enrolled? This is not a graduate school policy, but there is an office of the registrar policy that states such. The policy states that students who are utilizing university resources during any given semester, summer included, which include faculty PI time for student projects and milestones, need to be enrolled in paying tuition as appropriate. An important question to ask is, while doing this work, is this individual acting as a student, an employee, or both? 
Depending on your answer, you may need to adjust whether they are on tuition benefit and whether they are enrolled. Annualized requirement? What is the annualized requirement that is shown on the minimum support levels? Do students need to be supported all year round now? No, students do not need to be supported year round. Your department can still enact its own at its own discretion when selecting which semesters a student is on tuition benefit. The tuition benefit program will continue to function each semester rather than by each year. The annualized amount shown on the website is a summation of the minimum support levels for the academic year, shown as both nine months of support and a full 12 months of support. This is purely as a resource to help your department know an expected cost for salary or wages and fellowship support that is required over the entire academic year, should you choose to be supporting a student during that entire time. Will differentials be shown in the new tuition benefit reports? This is a suggestion we are still reviewing at this time. While we want to include as much helpful information in these reports as we possibly can, we also don't want to introduce unclear or confusing data points. Since differential tuition is not covered by tuition benefit, including it in our report data may create some additional confusion for those reviewing the reports. As such, we are unsure if there's a way to effectively include it in the report data at this time. This conversation will be ongoing with UIT and our campus partners as we move forward. Graduate fellows and subsidized health insurance. Are grad fellows and trainees students GSHIP eligible now? No, these students are still not eligible to participate in the graduate student health insurance plan. Um, via tuition benefit. However, departments can still consider covering them via department paid insurance. Traineeships and job codes. Is there a specific job code for the TR designation? No, these students are not set up via payroll. Their support is instead dispersed via AP monthly stipends, and as such, there will be no associated job code. We have five upcoming question and answer sessions that you are invited to participate in. This is for department coordinators and graduate advisors, directors of graduate studies, department chairs, accountants and directors of finance, and deans and dean's office representatives that participate in the tuition benefit program. Please keep in mind that this is not an opportunity for students to come and ask questions about tuition benefit, but is for staff and faculty who participate in the administration of the tuition benefit program. The Zoom links have been sent to coordinators, to graduate advisors and directors of graduate studies. If you do not have the Zoom link and would like to participate, please reach out to the tuition benefit team. If you have any questions or have any concerns or even suggestions that you want to bring to our attention, please feel free to contact us at any time. Our contact information is provided here by both email and phone number. The general email is also available for use as needed. Thank you for joining us for this training of the tuition benefit program changes for the academic year 2024-2025. Talk to you soon.